I want to I want to hop back in to the conversation a few steps back. We're talking about football players and and health and all of that. One of my favorite authors who writes for children and young adults is Jacqueline Woodson. And her books for young what's the category just before young yeah, adult but uh, her books are written in free verse. So here we've got a poetry connection to her. This is her most recent, it's called Before the Ever After. And it's told in the point of your old boy whose father is just a superstar football player. You know, one everybody knows. Oh, he's made up here, but one everybody knows, superstar, who all of a sudden behavior and ability to play is, is severely impaired. And he, as she tells this story that she made up, he is one of the first where they start recognizing repetitive uh, brain injury as a condition with the football players. And um, in the book, the medical profession keeps wanting to uh, kind of ignore, they want to, they want to figure out something else that's wrong with him because they don't want to have to say that football is killing this man. But anyhow, it's beautifully written from this little boy's point of view, how his, his hero becomes, well, to the point where he doesn't know his son's name, can't remember any, you know, just terrible stuff. My God. Um, and I read this one day and watched the Seahawks the next day. And it was <laughs> to watch those big defensive guys just go bam into each other. And you could just feel their brains going jiggle, jiggle, jiggle. Just anyhow, if you want a beautiful fast read sometime before, before the ever after. And who is the target audience? Uh, how um, do you think? Middle school. Middle school, okay. Mm -hmm. uh, clever sixth graders. <laughs> oh, that would be all my grandchildren. <laughs> oh, wow. It'd be me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But the, it really was a bizarre feeling to have read this book and then watch the ball game. And you could, you could just see what they were describing in the book as the all those bodies clashed and helmets thudded against each other. What's the well, average uh, career lifespan of an NFL player? Yeah, what, late, late 30s is a long time for many of them. Somebody like Brady, who's in his early 40s, is a real exception. And especially to stand out and, and not, uh, not be on the bench, you know. But... I know what made me think about the book when Shannon, when you said how those players and there's the threat of COVID, well, their game is a threat every time they show up. So yeah. I, I guess when you're making millions, um, you take, the, you take it, when you're making millions and your time frame for doing that is fairly slim, you know, in between 25 and 35 or whatever it is. Football players, especially, we hear about career ending injuries, but almost all of those guys uh, suffer long, long term uh, disability. You know, Errol Campbell, one of the great fullbacks of all time out of the University of Texas, he can't walk and, and uh, he just walks very painfully because of the beating his legs took when he was playing. I, I had a very slight injury playing football when I was in high school, and I still feel it in my legs because I, I got tackled and my legs got buckled underneath me. And I know that that's what it's from. That's where the pain is. So <laughs> that's the story of my career. Uh, I think the college players have a legitimate gripe that they don't get yeah. a, a piece of all the money that the universities make. They, Given the yeah. revenue that they generate, wow. Well, right, yeah. Some of the Huskies are like on food stamps. 
Some of them, yeah, that's horrible. I that was about they did an expose about it um, with Channel Five, and that was I don't know maybe about five six years ago. Well, my heart. <sighs> I'm well, are we going to have the poem today? Okay. What? Poetry? I mean, Amory, are we going to discuss the poem today? <laughs> I, I can't understand you right now. I said, I am being you. I am being Amory. Yes. Are we <laughs> going to discuss the poem today? Um, I, I didn't think that's what we were going to do today, but we can do whatever, whatever we want. I think we were going to look at allergy, aller, aller, an allergy for a walnut tree. <laughs> Well, we certainly could. Aller allergy. I. But I'm having fun talking. <laughs> yeah, we did everything. Our conversation yesterday ranged everywhere from let's reschedule to let's just say hello to maybe let's, you know, be oh. poets. Oh. Oh. So I don't know. Oh, I don't is. care. You, we don't have to. I, I've got it. Yeah, we could just talk, I guess. And I were putting the podcast together and trying to figure it out. Um, there's this one called the Dad's Podcast. And it's a look, it's a Bellingham, there's three Bellingham dads that get together and talk on Podbean. And we had a meeting with their producer, a guy, and <laughs> they were just recently interviewed by Whatcom Talks. And I thought that was kind of neat. Hmm. So get in line, Shannon. I know. Maybe we'll get some. <laughs> when I maybe when we're ready, if we're ever ready to expand and commercialize it or something or get a sponsor, we should get on Wacom Talks. I think that'd be fun. We'll yeah, see. I like the stuff Wacom Talks does. I I think they yeah. Have... You'll get no. Um... No criticism ever from us if you don't post right away. But it's wouldn't it be cool if you heard from one of our listeners, where was last Saturday's? Now that would be cool. <laughs> if somebody I, you know, I have to I can't help myself. I have to share a story. When I was working at KMRE, um, the, the station manager was so frustrated because he was having very technical problems. And they were threatening to get rid of him because uh, it wasn't bringing in any money. And he didn't know how to do that. And um, uh, I noticed that we were off the air for three, four, five days. And when I went back in to do my show, I said, I know you're having problems, but what the heck? We've been off for a week. And he says, I took us off. <laughs> Why? Why would you do that? See if anybody cared. I wanted to see if anyone was listening. <laughs> oh my gosh. Shannon, do we have a do our podcasts have a title? Yes. What is it? Uh it well it's it's poetry it's poetry club talks. Okay. Well I I would have proposed one. Are you ready for this? Yeah, let's hear it. Bylaws. What? <laughs> Bylaws. By laws. Shannon Laws. By oh. laws. Oh. Oh, that's laws. good. Thank you. All right. That was my like little that. attempt at some humor. I like it. I like it too. So repeat the title again, Poetry Club, what, the first part? Uh, it's, uh, what's our real name, you mean? Mm -hmm. what, what was the name you've been going by? Poetry Club, Club Talks. Talks. And then it I goes. Was. I dark. love that. Yeah. I, think. I love my laws. And then whoever we're talking about that week is the next part of the title of the show. Yeah. So like um, uh, poetry, poetry club talks, W.S. Merwin, like that. Okay, I have to show you this. I'm actually buying my books at Village Books. Oh, hey. Most amazing. 
How much did you get? I am going to retire. Eight dollars and ninety-seven cents. Yay! <laughs> what are you going to do with it? I'm going to retire. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Good job. That's pretty wonderful. Yeah. It's really fun, actually. So what's what's our pleasure? Are we serious today? Do we want to talk about <laughs> walnut tree? Yeah, I'd like to I'd like to at least read it and talk about it for a token amount of time. OK, does it, do everybody have access to it? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Ron, do you? Oh, yeah, I have it. Would you would you read it for us? <clears throat> sure. OK. Thank you. I will be happy to. But uh, I'm still working on retrieving it. Oh, it knocked him to the floor. Whoa. <laughs> Elegy for a walnut tree. Old friend, now there is no one alive who remembers when you were young. It was high summer when I first saw you <laughs> in the blaze of day most of my life ago. With the dry grass whispering in your shade and already you had lived through wars and echoes of wars around your silence. Two days of parting and seasons of absence, with a house emptying as the years went their way until it was home to bats and swallows. And still when spring climbed towards summer, you opened once more the curled sleeping fingers of newborn leaves as though nothing had happened. You and the seasons spoke the same language. And all those years, all these years, I have looked through your limbs to the river below and the roofs and the night, and you were the way I saw the world. I don't know about the rest of you. I have to read something like this three or four times just to get a footing, uh, just to decide what, what are the words and where the sequence is and so on. And last night when I was rereading the murder, uh, Merwin poems, I read those last three or four lines and realized, I think more clear, suddenly clearly uh, what they said, you and the season spoke the same language. And then, and all these years I have looked through your limbs to the river below and the roofs and the night, and you were the way I saw the world. Uh, just kind of stunned me about, for all we talk about individual perspective and and so on, uh, to to frame your perspective on life in just this way through a familiar sight uh, really resonated for me. You know, <laughs> when I was raised, there was a Norway maple in the front yard, and. I've always looked at the world through that maple. So I really resonated with this poem, you know, the idea of, of watching time pass through the twigs and branches of, of the maple tree. So. There was uh, a walnut tree in our yard, along with several ever evergreens, really nice house we had. And um, I, I hesitate to say this, but I used to hug that tree. There was some comfort too. in that rough old bark and my arms just fit around it. And also next door, there was a fig tree. And I have such happy memories because the neighbors would let me climb into it and pick figs. And they, you know, of course I've never had a fig that tasted that good before. <laughs> or since. <laughs> or I mean, or since. And it was the 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 branches were so sweeping and climbable, and I've often thought I should be rereading those books about trees that have come out. Overstory I, is one of them. Mm -hmm. I haven't done that yet. They're wonderful. Yeah. They're so wonderful. this 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 poem seems um, relevant in some odd way. Well, not odd for a poet to take on this prism, this perspective. 
Uh, I've never read something like that before. One of the notes I wrote myself um, when I was first looking at this and we were going to be talking about it was the joy of a mature tree, old when you first meet it, and then old as you live, leave. This, this idea of this tree, it doesn't have an indefinite lifespan, but in comparison to our own, in comparison to Merwin, um, who, who met the tree when it was full grown and the tree will continue afterwards. There's something, something quite wonderful about that. I love the phrase, the dry grass whispering in your shade and already oh. had lived through wars. That is just so beautiful. Well, and the contrast is with your silence. Already you had lived through wars and echoes of wars around your silence. Through days of parting and seasons of absence, the uh, vacuum in the poem, it, it, you know, it, the suggestion, I feel a suggestion in it that human beings need, of course, to learn the value of silence. Interesting from a poet. Uh, and, and then just the whispering of the grass. I really like that line too. I love the curling fingers of the newborn leaves. You know, it's just, it's just a beautiful poem. Yeah, it is. One of the, I don't know who he was, but one of the persons that I read who was writing a commentary on this poem thought that it seems strange that one would address a tree as old friend. How audacious a use of the pathetic fallacy is that? I, I guess maybe because I didn't climb trees as energetically as Linda did uh, as a child, but I certainly had trees as friends. I don't see anything strange with addressing a tree as old friend. No. That, that rings so true to me. I, for a long time, had a scar for years and years that went the length of my forearm from a tree that I had, I had climbed at my grandmother's house, and my parents had told me not to do that. And I was up high, and I slid down from the tree, and I just scraped this open wound, and it had parts of the tree in it. And for, I know it sounds grisly, but I wasn't really seriously hurt but i like that scar <laughs> you won that in battle huh <laughs> I, I did and i love i know i didn't get to see my go to my grandmother's who lived my other grandmother who lived out of town and it just reminded me of her little house and her and i was kind of a symbol i guess i'm sorry this is, on. <laughs> this is getting further afield but <laughs> i have a scar on my right hand when I was two years old, my twin brother closed the oven door on my hand to tell me that I should not be reaching into the oven. Oh. And, and now when I look at it, I mean, he died in July. It is, it's this continuing bond between us. Oh. Oh. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. All right, who else has scars? <laughs> I have ten I have a question about scars. I, I have, have many, scars. but not interesting stories. Mm, I've got tons of scars, and some have healed better than others. But I have scars from my time working in factories, and uh, uh, you know, you try to be as safe and as careful as possible. But factories are dangerous places, and I'm always fascinated by the shape of the scar. Uh, usually, they're burns burns and cuts. When I worked at the factories, I'd see another person with a similar shaped scar or scab in a similar place on their body. And I realized they had been working on the same machine that I was. Mm. <laughs> so we had some camaraderie <laughs> with, <laughs> with that. 
trick is to learn to love our emotional scars as much as we love the physical scars. Oh, good grief. That is too ponderous a <laughs> subject. <laughs> and you're right, of course. <laughs> you know, it's interesting that every time I've now read this poem after the first uh, after our, our first look at Merwin, I've, be, I've become more and more convinced that it's almost perfect. Mm -hmm. uh, and and I'm, I'm interested that he calls it elegy. It, it sounds almost more like an ode, mm -hmm. uh, a, a paean to it. But the, the way the poem starts and then just uh, explores this whole perspective on the world and the way the tree was so central to how he viewed things. Uh, Is that telling us the tree's been cut down? Well, I'm not sure. It looks like oh. the tree continues. Yeah, I hope not. I didn't. I didn't read anything that made me think it was down, other than. So my, I had a question on why elegy? Well, it's, it's not an elegy on a walnut tree. I'm wondering Four. if the elegy is, is, if the poem is written for the tree, but the elegy has to do with other things in this world, like the writer. Or Merwin is writing the elegy but has to write it now because Merwin is, is more time time dated than the tree is. I, I have this sense here the tree was was full grown when when Merwin or the speaker of the poem first saw the tree and um, that sense that it's going to continue past Merwin or whoever the voice is that's speaking. I have a question. I am right just right here on the top of my head. I'm hearing the voices of an argument that I, a discussion that I've had with folks in open mics um, that um, nature poetry is uh, considered the airhead of um, the human condition, and that urban uh, poetry is uh, more real. It has more substance um, that to write about a flower or a tree is, you know, what suburbanites do, and that they're not really getting in touch with their feelings. Th these are these are comments that I've heard people say, um, and I, you know, I, I personally don't have see that because I use I use a, a lot of analogy and metaphor uh, in nature uh, related. Uh, allergy, uh, analogies and metaphors. Do you think that this poem is somehow discussing the human condition? Absolutely. Yes. How? It's, to me, to me, a tree represents rootedness, which all of us human beings long for the sense of belonging, a sense of place, a place we're nourished and so forth. So the whole business and the strength of a tree and to withstand the wind is all we do what we desire. I mean, to me, a tree is representative of what we long to be. It's um, so this, to me, this, this is using a tree as a metaphor for what it is we um, we look for, long for, um, hope to be, all that stuff. I, I, I wouldn't. I would not disagree with the idea that the tree is a metaphor, but I think, and I don't know if it's worth making this distinction. The tree, the tree, I believe, is representative. It's it's life outside of us, life beyond us, but it's really life that endures. And to me, that's 
what the poem is about is endurance. Mm -hmm. it, it lives in spite of everything else that's going around. It lives in contrast to everything that's ephemeral. Mm -hmm. uh, those wonderful lines, uh, echoes of war on, though through days of parting and seasons of absence, with a house emptying as the years went their way until it was home to bats and swallows. And still, a beautiful line, when spring climbed towards summer, you opened once more the curled sleeping fingers. There are wonderful passages. Yeah. That, that fourth line, in the blaze of day, most of my life ago, gosh. Uh, the third line from the bottom where he says, in all these years, I have looked through your limbs. To me, I am giving Merwin credit for never using a word that he doesn't mean. So he's not saying between the limbs or around the limbs or anything. He's saying through the limbs. What do you think he means by that? Good question. I, I immediately think about perspective and, um, uh, you know, that we don't uh, see things clearly, that there's this, uh, like you mentioned earlier, a stability about the tree and that it is some sort of a standard that he has used, a measuring stick in a sense, with everything else he's seen in his life. Uh, somehow he's able to kind of reference uh, abstractly, perhaps, uh, this tree um, as he processes things, as he grows and matures and has life experiences. This tree, in a sense, is, and, and what it stands for is, has helped him and guide him, perhaps. I think that looking through the limbs is a, becomes the familiar frame for him. Mm -hmm. the, the tree was very central, and I'll, say, I'll use the word again, it's the frame through which he became accustomed to seeing life and gauging the world. Uh, I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> could he have said, uh, could the, instead of a tree, could, you have, could he have used... Uh, the eyes of a dog or a child, something else that grows, that you can see grow uh, in your lifetime? I think there are many other things that you can write a poem about that are part of the way you filter life and the world. Mm -hmm. When I was a kid, we lived, there was, at two o'clock in the morning, the train would go by every night. <laughs> and I got very used to that sound. Uh, a friend of mine uh, didn't want to live where there was traffic. And I grew up with the sounds of the city and always was used to hearing cars going by outside. And I've always loved that buzz, that hum of life out, outside my window. You know, when I look back I and look back on my childhood experiences, I hear a lot of that. And I just, I have to add this. When my son John went to Johns Hopkins, he lived in the city. He called me up one morning and he, about seven o'clock in the morning, the first day that he lived in this apartment, he said, Dad, you know how you always told me that you loved growing up with the sounds of the city? And I said, yeah. And he said, well, I heard it this morning. And he, he just wanted to share that. Um, oh. Anyway, God, it's a great poem. Shannon, when you said, could it be through the eyes of a dog or something else? I want to jump up and say, no, no, let's leave him with his tree. It's perfect. I don't want anything different. It must but, be a tree. <laughs> but, uh, you know, someone will do that. And, and uh, Billy Collins relating. Uh, uh what's that poem about the weight of a dog yes that, mm -hmm. that was studied yeah there are lots of ways and i think 
this is perfect and Billy Collins was perfect and who knows what else someone will pose in a, in a similar manner. I, I'm I, could, I, could, I could fight back uh, at, at what you had said, Shannon, that, that some say that only the truth comes from the gritty and from the urban. And I think truth can and does come from the urban and the gritty, but not only. Right. I have, yeah. Go ahead. I'm de I'm, well, I'm just defending my tree. I'm defending Mary, <laughs> Mary Oliver and her ability to, yeah. <laughs> to reach us. Well, just when I used to go to open mics a lot, um, I ran into a lot of folks who did not do nature poems. And I, and I happened to have a nice little selection of nature poems. Uh, so I felt like I kind of stood out. We had a guest speaker who came in and uh, he was uh, from an urban part of Texas. And I asked him, I said, uh, do you write any nature poems? And I happened to be standing with a group of other people and they all laughed. I, 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 it was a serious question, but they thought it was absolutely ridiculous. Uh, you know, uh, and he said, he said, I do not have any nature poems. Um, his poems were placed in houses and in streets and in cars, uh, schools, institutions. Fine. And As if humans are all there is, there is no nature. We are not part of nature. We are not, sub, we are not a subsection of nature. We are the ultimate. That's very narcissistic, <laughs> my opinion. <laughs> I, I like that you said, we are the ultimate. And then you recognize that that's very <laughs> narcissistic. I like that. <laughs> This is a this is a touch <laughs> off subject, although nature and and big cities. I was at a conference in New York City. Linda flew in for the weekend. It was March, but it ended up being a really sunny day. And as we were, I don't know where we were wandering, we came across a city park, a fenced-in city park, probably about a oh, yeah. quarter of a block, quarter of a block in size. And it was jammed with children. And my first thought was, oh, this is wonderful. These children are out in this unexpected sunshine in March. Isn't this wonderful? And then I looked at the park that they had to share. There was no grass. It was such a small area that the kids had just tromped the grass. You know, just it was gone. And, and I thought, is this nature for you, children? Is this crowded? <laughs> Quarter block is this nature? Mm. I don't know. I think I don't there know. are many yeah. ways that we can interpret this poem and probably be pretty much in agreement. And uh, for me, it's it's a poem about mutability. If you look at medieval poetry, especially in the poetry of the Renaissance, every poet had his crack at mutability. That the condition of life is constant change. And for Merwin, uh, the speaker in the poem, the tree is the constant within this, mm -hmm. this world. And he appreciates it. He, he's saying thank you to the tree. It, I really, I just really feel this love he has for the tree and recognizing its existence. And homage to his I personal think he's life. also paying homage to it, to recognizing the wonder of it. The, yeah. Uh, yeah. 